To be honest, I've frankly grown accustomed to my present condition, almost come to like it. You see, I already possess a body, the Baxter building itself, with each mechanism serving as one of my organs. Power swaps, it's a classic. You have a group of people with powers and the mind tends to wander over into what would happen if those powers were changed around somehow. Now, usually in a group situation, this tends towards the members of the group switching powers with each other. However, when one ventures away from that model, something truly interesting can happen. We're gonna take a journey back to the classic what ifs, which, why didn't I put that there? Hold on. I never have the right things where they're supposed to be. I did that thing again where you start collecting them in the smaller trades and then they become an omnibus and then there's just sadness, you know, get your tiny violin. The what if tale we're going back to promises so many things, including but not limited to Ben Grimm with dragon wings and a Reed Richards who is just a floating brain. You're intrigued, but before we swap it up, comics aren't the only way to experience some Marvel what if. This video is brought to you by Hero Clicks and me in the future. Hero Clicks is an award winning miniatures game with a simple beginner a friendly set of rules that makes it easy to learn. And numerous figures from multiple fandoms so you can have some creative fun gaming experiences. And that includes playing in alternate worlds such as with the Marvel Studios Disney Plus What If set. Oh yes, we're getting specific. This set comes with pre-made scenarios which you can play through or you can customize your experience for increased replay value. The learning curve is not as daunting as it may first appear on the surface. For example, this collection comes with a complete set of instructions step by step. Plus it's fun because you're playing out scenarios with your favorite characters and your friends. Hopefully, or you're competing, I don't know what you're doing. These 10 miniature figurines are pre-painted and double as collectibles, but keep them out from underfoot, for they can be as deadly as Lego. If you're interested, then check out Hero Clicks. There will be a link in the description below. Check out this set or whatever heroes or villains catch your fancy. This set coming soon, time of recording. And if you use the code CASUALLYCOMICS10, that will get you 10% off at shopwizkids.com. I kind of want a giant watcher now to keep my giant Galactus company. The watcher is our segue back to the Fantastic Four. The zombie cap was my daughter's favorite one. No zombies in this story, but there are man Androids. Yes, mandroid, not android. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and let's ponder, what if? In 1977, Marvel Comics launched their first What If series, which would tell tales of the Marvel Universe if things had gone a different way. By showcasing worlds, at first guided by the observing narrator, the Watcher Iwatu, where things were different. So multiverse shenanigans, but before the concept had been fully formed over at Marvel. Time of recording, you can't turn around without tripping into some part of the multiverse. Everywhere, it's everywhere. The What If series would have a couple of continuous runs, but it would also have a series of mini-series, one shots, it would vary over time. And the purpose of the What If series would change and shift as the industry and conventions changed around it. For the first run, which lasted from 1977 to 1984, spanning 47 issues, for the most part, especially at the start, the focus was on creating fully fleshed out alternate stories. For changing the track could make things truly different, but still interesting and feasible, and not so different that it felt like something you couldn't connect to. Whereas as the series went on, it would hit a period where it felt more like it was there to reaffirm the status quo, to showcase why things happening in the main universe was the best way for them to happen. Or also sometimes to showcase things that were going to happen but didn't because of changes like the Jarella situation. Later on, it could be viewed as a bit of a nostalgia play or even later as a cash grab. More so than a true desire to play with the concept of what if. And as it continues, for what if is a strong concept, we'll see where it goes. Time recording. Many of the early stories would feature the Fantastic Four. Marvel's first family would, as a result of their popularity and brand recognition, find themselves in some intriguing alternate worlds. Heck, the first issue where Spider-Man joins the Fantastic Four veers off into Sue marrying Namor. You know grab this and it's volume two. Where's volume one at? This is volume one. There we go. Now I can look at Namor and Sue and buff Watcher. He's so buff. You'll see when we get into it. He's just the buffest. But we're not here for those shenanigans. We're here for issue six. What if the Fantastic Four had different powers? Which has the same title inside as outside. Plus 10. That wasn't something that always happened with these what ifs. Sometimes the titles could vary and the changes could make it sound like you were going to get a very different story. This issue is credited to Roy Thomas with plotting help from Christy Marks. Rick Holberg and Don Glutt were also involved. Pencils are by Jim Craig for pages one to 11 and Rick Holbert for the rest. So now you get to play the see if you can spot the difference game. Inks by Sam Granger and letters by John Costanza, but only for the first 11 pages. Then Joe Rosen did the rest. Why? I don't know. I'd like to though. Probably something really mundane, like timing or something. The cover is a lot of a lot. The alternate versions of the Fantastic Four fighting their alternate universe counterparts. Spoilers, that is not what Johnny is going to look like as the Mandroid at all. The fabulous new Fantastic Four, Mandroid, Big Brain, and the dynamic deadly Ultra Woman, Dragonfly. Oh no. Sue and Ben are out for blood. The issue starts with the Fantastic Four of the 616, so the main 
universe taking on some pretty low-level villains. They even say so while they're doing it that they're wasting their time. That must be very hurtful as you're being beat down. Ben's right. We're taking entirely too much time to put these two-bit hoodlums away. What this sequence is here for is to give a refresher course of the Force powers in action to show how useful and cool they are and how well they work together as a team. It will serve as a nice contrast when we see their alternates later on. This because there will be a comparison point within the issue itself. Maybe I can speed things up a bit with an invisibility power most people forget I have. The power is that she can turn other people invisible and that she can do it from a distance. It would be truly terrifying, especially if you weren't aware she was there and then it just started happening to you, suddenly couldn't see yourself. After they defeat their foes, Johnny poses dramatically and wonders what if they had gotten different powers from those pesky cosmic rays. Which yes, is a rather obvious segue, but is also something they've wondered at different points, so it doesn't feel entirely out of place. It's cheesy, but it works. You could almost imagine the dream sequence transitions of the ripples as he says it. Indeed, youthful Johnny Storm poses valid questions. Whoa, the Watcher's been hitting the gym, he's swole. The Watcher then retells the origin of the original Fantastic Four. And while it may be familiar territory for some readers, they do change it up and add some details and make it more dramatic in places. They definitely up the fear factor and the fact that the rays are messing them up, so it does feel a bit more novel and less like a retread. But then the Watcher drops a bombshell. It's what will allow for the whole concept of the power changing. This by putting forth the idea that the Fantastic Four's powers were influenced by their own subconscious desires and their personality traits. Now this is not entirely novel, as the Forest powers do in some ways reflect their personalities, but it's interesting to see how they lay it out here. Susan Storm, who in those days remained in the background, in short, was virtually invisible. What's interesting about that comment is that even in the classic Fantastic Four issues, they would try and address that because sometimes people would write it and say that Sue didn't do enough, and then the Fantastic Four would clap back because in universe, there was a letters column and they would sometimes respond to it. In fact, this is one of the ways Reed would hype her up, highlighting the fact that just because some of her contributions were stealth based or less seemingly overtly aggressive didn't make them less than. It's a rarity for Reed, cherish it. Johnny Storm, hot tempered and with a nostalgic fondness for an earlier hero called the Human Torch. Woo, Jim Hammond shout out. Reed Richards would go to almost any lengths in the pursuit of scientific truth and Benjamin J. Grimm remained consistent with the hard, brutish image he had always presented. It's interesting to see their powers conceptualized this way, although from those descriptions, Reed seemed like the most of a stretch. So this is the setup for how the cosmic rays are going to be utilized differently in the new universe. They're going to highlight different facets of the Force personalities. Let's go over there now, live! Ugh, my head feels like it's about to burst. Like my Brain's trying to break free. Johnny's description of his organs getting hard and cold is horrifying. What would that even feel like? Ben is experiencing terrible back pain and Sue is fine. This is a great comic to be Sue. Once they land, Ben grows some pretty impressive dragon wings. He claims they're a cross between a dragon and a flies. I'm struggling to find the fly, Ben. I don't believe what I'm hearing. You've turned into some kind of monster. I actually think you're digging it. Ben Grimm's been online. He knows about wing fake. He knows how popular he's about to be. Look, Sue's already hugging him. Also, what what happened to Johnny's shirt? It was fine when they landed, and now it is strategically ripped. Johnny slowly turns metallic, and I thought when I first read this he was going full Colossus. But somehow, the cosmic rays turned him into... He's become some kind of living robot. Yes, some kind of a... Mandroid. Sue is the one person who enters straight swap territory. She now has Reed's powers, and the cosmic rays were kind enough to alter the fabric in her clothes so they could stay calm as code approved. But then they suddenly realize, weren't there four of them? There were four of them. Reed is just a brain on the ground, a sentient living telepathic brain who can also exert some form of psychic influence because he forces Ben to pick him up. Can he live like that? Obviously, I can, Sue. And Ben, I swear that I'll never again dominate your mind. Not control, dominate. And so they need names. Reed becomes Big Brain because it's what Ben calls him. And yes, that is a callback to the 616 where the thing called him that, but it is also a terrible superhero name. Johnny decides on Mandroid and he's sticking to it. Ben becomes Dragonfly. And Sue, Rubber Girl. No, no, that's too corny. Make that Ultra Woman. That name went from zero to 100 right quick. See, Johnny, this is why you don't necessarily go with the first name the pop into your head. Ultra Woman is also a huge upgrade on the name Mr. Fantastic when it comes to the stretching power set. But now we need the explanations. Why these powers? Rationalize for us, you want to? Perhaps you have already guessed why the cosmic rays affected them thusly. Reed Richards is the most obvious, his intellect having gained him fame as one of the world's greatest minds. Benjamin J. Grimm has always loved to fly, and now he has the ability to do so 
under his own power. Susan Storm's pliable personality has enabled her to adapt, to mold herself to fit in with her more dominating friends. Um, that description makes her sound like a massive doormat when it appears that what they're going for is that she has emotional intelligence and so can navigate these social situations and can help bring different personalities together. At least I hope that's what they're going for. Pliable sounds like she's going to end up in a cult. And Johnny Storm's fascination with and knowledge of things mechanical has somehow converted him into a metallic robot. Okay, serious question. When you think of Johnny Storm, do you think lover of things mechanical? I mean, he likes cars and he does tinker with things and love fixing them, but for that to equal Android? Well, I mean, if Reed reaching for science can equal stretch powers, I think they just wanted to make him a mandroid. Anyway, they're the Fantastic Four now, and it's about to get really clever and fun. They have a different rep because they're different, so that trickles down to how they meet Doctor Doom. The Fantastic Four, well, the three who go out and do stuff, stop some demons from stealing Blackbeard's treasure, which was what Doom was after in Fantastic Four issue 5 when he met the four. The editor's note actually has an error misattributing the Blackbeard story to issue 4, but that was where they met Namor. With this sequence, we also get to see how the team works together, and while it's good, they do have some difficulties that they wouldn't have had if they had their original powers. For example, Ben's hurting his hands when he's punching the demons. Doctor Doom is very upset because he had to wait a whole year to summon those demons and he's not waiting for another one. He needs treasure now, stat. What kind of skull is that? Doom uses magic to investigate and sees the mysterious fourth member and his crystal science dome and is curious because the rumors are that they're a Fantastic Four, but who's the fourth one? We get a nice panel of seeing these Fantastic Four fighting some of their early foes. Whoa, Sue is all up on Namor. But they don't seem into each other here. I guess Namor isn't down for the stretch powers. Doom is able to discern the living brain, which is already a better name than Big Brain, even though it sounds like a villain name, is Reed Richards. Well, that means it's time to mess with him, which also means it's time to bring back one of the best parts, the dolls, Fantastic Four dolls. But now it raises so many more questions, because Doom goes on a rant at his Reed doll. You know, Reed took his face, he's gonna make him suffer, mwahaha. But in the original timeline, it seemed like the team had merch. I joked that Doom had made the dolls, but really he could have bought them. But in this universe, there definitely wouldn't be a Reed doll. So he made that. Also, it was shirtless. I have so many questions. Why? And now he's going to have to make another because he pops the head off. He decides he'll use Reed's brain to power a time machine so he can go back and steal Blackbeard's treasure whenever he wants, which is how the Fantastic Four met him. He sent three of them back in time, not Sue, and then they had to get the treasure. I think he kept Sue there and just monologued at her. Let me tell you about the time Reed messed up my face. So he goes off to plan something appropriately soul-crushing for Reed, and we get to see how the other heroes are adapting to their lives. Reed has built a series of tubes that run all through the Baxter building, and he's able to continue his research, as well as keep tabs on the team. He does low-key miss being human, but he's also made the best of his circumstances. Ben is mobbed by fans who are all over his wings, and he finds that in a reversal of the universe where he was the thing, he still hates all this attention, but it's because it's too much. Everybody's all up in his space. Ben just doesn't like being the center of attention, be it positive or negative, although that kind of fan mobbing, not positive. Stop trying to take pieces of his wings. Don't touch people. Stop touching people. Skrulls, Molemen, and Submariners, I can handle, but fans can really demolish ya. I'll look in on my once future brother-in-law. Is there a reason Johnny doesn't wear a shirt? Must people be blinded by the chrome at all times? Oh, also Johnny is a technopath, which is an awesome ability, but they don't really utilize it. In fact, in this scene, he just uses it to turn on some stereos really loud because some teens are making fun of him. Next, Sue. She's fine. She's pondering her future while she plays with some kids in the park by turning herself into a giant top. Reed and I used to dream of getting married, having children. Wow, this really is another universe. I'm glad you mentioned that, Sue. I I've been meaning to talk to you about Submariner. I always thought we had an understanding, Sue. I thought when the time was right that you and I, I mean, don't say it, Reed. Please not now, not yet. I'm not even sure of my own feelings. But Ben has always cared for me too. And now that Reed's the way he is, well. Ben must feel super great about being Constellation. At least he has a body guy. Reed misses Sue. He loves her. In fact, it's really eating at him, which is why he's constantly working on things to keep his mind off it. But his moping is interrupted by an intruder. Tis Doom. But he doesn't recognize him yet, so this gives Doom a chance to play with his food, as it were. I am a master of robotics, Richard. It is feasible for me to create a humanoid form to house your magnificent brain. Yes, Doom could do that. Why didn't Reed dry? Also, what is going on with the Doom voice? I don't know, it's different every time. So is my voice. I have sick ones more. To be honest, I've frankly grown accustomed to my present condition, almost come to like it. You see, I already possess a body, the Baxter building itself, with 
each mechanism serving as one of my organs. The anthropomorphic housing you propose would merely limit the functions of big brain. But then Doom hits him with the Sue can't love a building. She doesn't want to be on a TLC special. <sighs> Do not expect me to believe those telepathic lies, Richards. You may have lost your human body, but you still retain your human soul with its capacity to feel envy. Yes even to love. This scene, it could be very different with just a few tweaks. We interrupt this train of thought to bring you Ben telling Giant to give himself a nice lube job, which would have meant something less lewd at the time. Carry on. Strange, is it not, that even vast powers such as yours cannot replace the loss of Susan Storm? Stop it, I can't stand it. He agrees to go with Doom, the mysterious man with the shifting accent who just appeared in his building. He only realizes something's really wrong when Doom attacks Mandroid as he comes in and sees what's going on, you know, on the way to his lube job. And it's then he learns that Doom placed him inside a container that could contain his telepathic ability, which is the perfect time for Doom to reveal that it was him, Victor Von Doom, the whole time. Now that you are at the most vulnerable, Richard, you will pay dearly for not helping me in the past. But that's what he was trying to do. You didn't listen. There's no use arguing with Doom. Everything's Reed's fault. Just accept it. It's how it has to be for Victor to feel good about himself. With Reed gone, it's up to Ben to relay who Doom is, since he was Reed's roommate in college after Victor didn't want to be Reed's. The roommate stats is something that has been subtly tweaked over time. There's even been what if sent around what if Doom had a different roommate, the one where his roommate was Tony Stark. Also, Ben starts to wonder, does Sue even love him at all? Or is she still in love with the personality, the true essence of Reed Richards? I like to roast Reed and Sue, but there is something compelling about the idea that Sue does know and like Reed's personality, even though it's abrasive and off-putting. That she understands him and his flaws and is actually okay with them. It's a balancing act, though, that can easily careen into Reed coming across or just being awful, and Sue being treated like a doormat. It's more interesting than the she's just with him for his powers. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, know what I mean? That take has even managed to make its way into the comics themselves. In the story, she hasn't really shown the inclination that she loved Ben, except for hugging him that one time and thinking, well, I guess, you know, she knows Ben, he sure is around. Namor smells like fish, I guess. Doom wants to strip Reed of his personality and make him his computer processor so he can look upon him and know he must always work for Doom. But the team arrive and they have to split up and you get a cool sequence of each of them having to go against a Doom booby trap and coming out on top through a mastery of their powers. So these powers get a chance to shine. It's not treated as, oh, the main verse powers are better. It's just treated as they're different. Johnny gets stuck to the floor, which means he gets to do a sci-fi classic, reverse the polarity. Despite being contained in a seemingly telepathy blocking case, Reed and Doom still manage to have a psychic fight. And when Doom is overpowering the team and starting on Sue, I grow weary of hearing such threats from those who cannot back them up. He just slapped her across the face and with his messed up hand, cause Johnny sacrificed an arm to get rid of one of Doom's blasters on his armor. Well, no one slaps Sue except Reed. And watching his former colleague as the dialogue calls them slap Sue, well, it activates something inside of him. It amps up his power level. He's powered by rage and love. And with every vicious blow, Richard's brain literally pulsates with rage crackles with energies, a warning aroused by a conflicting emotions, love and hate. Reed sends a blast at Doom, but Doom tries to resist and activate the self-destruct. But because of this, it causes Reed to try even harder to dominate his mind, sending his full essence at Doom, but Doom manages to hit the button anyway. When the smoke clears, it's revealed that Reed's attempts were so aggressive that he projected himself into Doom's body. Who survived the blast? He had a force field. They established that while he was fighting Johnny. And Sue, she's really into it. It's Reed. It's fantastic. This inspires her to call him Mr. Fantastic. Look at how Sue is looking at him in his blue Doom panel. Doom can get it, but we already knew that. So behold, the new Fantastic Four. You readers are probably asking yourself, did this Reed Richards and Susan Storm find each other again on their own Earth? I am, but it's only one of many questions that I'm asking, and also based on how Sue is gazing upon him, probably. I think the answer is yes. What I'm wondering is, did Reed really kill Doom, or did he just subsume him in his mind? If so, is Doom still there? threatening to re-emerge. Is Reed's personality more dominant than Doom's? Could he keep it suppressed at all times? Would they end up in a split personality scenario? Or would their personalities fuse, creating a new person who is neither Holy Reed or Doom? This version of the team would reappear in the second ongoing What If series, which ran from 1989 to 1998 in issue 39. When they're contacting alternate versions of the Fantastic Four to fight a threat, they contact this one against the Watcher's wishes. So we get to see that Reed ditched the cowl part of the ensemble. Oh, and also Johnny has a top half to his outfit now, and his head is no longer metallic. You don't 
get to answer those questions if you had them, and they're all brutally killed on panel. It's pretty sad. They were neat. They could have been fun to revisit. Now, the Fantastic Four are, of course, no strangers to the power swap trope. What if number 11 from the second run would ask the question, what if they all had the same power, showcasing four different stories where they each transform in the same way? During Mark Wade's run in the mid-2000s, Johnny and Sue swapped powers and had to have them swap back. The Rise of the Silver Surfer film from 2007 featured as a key plot point that Johnny Storm was changing powers with his teammates whenever he touched them. The oft-overlooked Fantastic Four series World's Greatest Heroes featured an episode where the team swapped powers with each other called Bait and Switch, also in 2007. This episode was a doom plot and heavy on the shenanigans. <laughs> I forgot what a handsome devil I was. What makes this what if stand out is that it's a genuine attempt to create an entire world around this concept. And while there is humor, it's also taken pretty seriously. It's well crafted, the plot lines tie together, well minus a couple of seeming hiccups, and it creates a story that feels like it could go on, like there could be more adventures for this team. They have an interesting yet familiar dynamic. Inside this issue, there are some art inconsistencies and coloring errors. Even with that though, the powers that are laid out are interesting and there's more that could be done with some of them. Also with the characters' personalities. Even the idea of Reed as this giant living building was really intriguing. What if he really did end up missing being a building? This is a story that wholly embraces and takes advantage of the what if concept. It is a strong, truly classic what if, as she picks up the correct one. Yes. I want to hear from you. Do you think these powers were a glow up? If you were operating based on their personality traits, what powers would you give them? Did you think this was an interesting story? Can you pick a better name for Big Brain? Why do you think this name or didn't like Sue? Or did he? Tell me things down below as well as some of your favorite power swap moments or moments you've all I missed. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.